Welcome back to the Dr. Cliff Show. This is part one of a three-part series on best practices and how they can make or break your hearing aid treatment. Coming up. back live for our 12th episode of the Dr. Cliff Show. I'm Dr. Cliff Olson, audiologist and founder of Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am here with my co-host. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Rachel Cook. I'm also an audiologist at Applied Hearing Solutions, and we use the term best practices a lot on this show because they are so important in receiving high-quality hearing treatment. Um, and today we are starting a three-part series on what best practices are and the role that they play in audiological assessment, which is what we're starting out with today. Then we're going to meet with Dr. Liz White for our Hearing Up Provider Spotlight. Super excited to speak with her. And after that, we're going to get into hearing aid selection measures. And so make sure you like and subscribe so that you receive notifications when we release part two of this series, um, because these are definitely not episodes that you wanna miss. And make sure if you have questions, please, please drop them in the comments below. Uh, if you have questions and they come up, ask them nice and early so that we can get to them at the end. And with that, I'm going to jump straight into our very first sponsor segment here. So if you have tinnitus like I do, you know that quiet environments can be some of the tougher ones to deal with, particularly when you're trying to relax, sleep at night, work, things like that. So Sound Oasis has an entire lineup of sound generator products that can help to add a little bit of sound conditioning into the environment and help to hopefully decrease the perception of tinnitus as well. In particular, I use their BST100 sound speaker. It has built-in sleep sounds with the addition of Bluetooth audio as well. So you can either use any of the 10 to 20-ish sounds that you pick to put onto your custom sound card, or you can use the audio from your own Bluetooth device, like your phone, tablet, anything like that. Um, they also have a bunch of apps as well, so go ahead and go to the App Store and type in Sound Oasis for some of those tinnitus sound generator apps as well. You get the light version for free, but you get the pro version with any purchase of any Sound Oasis product. So make sure you visit soundoasis.com and use their promo code SLEEP. That'll get you 20% off of any of their products. So thank you so much to Sound Oasis. All right, so let's jump right into it. Uh, a lot of people always ask me, because I'm kind of known as the best practices guy out there, but everyone wants to know what best practices are. So you know, I typically explain it in the fashion of, no matter what profession that you are in, there are certain procedures procedures that you must follow that are proven by research to result in better outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're obviously going to be talking a lot about the hearing aid industry today, very contextual to that. But when you look at other professions, I mean, literally every other profession that is out there, they have identified certain things that you should absolutely do if you want to achieve a higher outcome. Right. And so one of the ones that we like to use a lot is, okay, if you go get a surgery done, is your doctor going to wash their hands? Yeah. So washing your hands is considered a best practice if you're a surgeon. Now just imagine if you were to go to a surgeon who did not wash their hands before performing surgery. Now, if you look back in history, there was actually a time where people thought you were crazy for washing your hands before performing a surgery. And there was someone who came out and said, no, look, the bacteria that's growing on our hands, if we go in and do surgeries with dirty hands, it is gonna create infections and then you're gonna either die or we're gonna have to amputate whatever limb that we're working on, yeah. right? So, and this goes, and it stands true for every profession that's out there that has some kind of research backing to it. Um, and so when you look at the field of audiology, it's no different. There is a bunch of research that happens in our world. And when we start working with patients, we, you know, we work with adult patients. Yep. I mean, there are pediatric patients out there. There are individuals who work with balance disorders, things like that. We stay very contextual to treating adults yeah. with hearing loss with hearing aids. Yes. And so there are guidelines that were published by AAA back in 2006. And I'll give you uh, an example of what that looks like right here. So I forget how many pages that is, but it's pretty extensive. And I would say that it's a very difficult read, but as an audiologist, this document holds all of the best practices that we have inside of adult hearing aid fitting. Mm -hmm. 
Now, AAA, uh, who developed the task force here, and you can see all the task force members, uh, virtually all of them are role models of mine. I know they're role models of yours as well. Right. A lot of them wrote textbooks as us go, uh, when we went through uh, our audiology programs. Right. But um, these particular individuals took a look at all of the research that existed out there at the time and determined, okay, what are the best things that you could possibly be doing to achieve the highest level outcome? And those are the things that you need to do. Mm -hmm. And I know that we're going to be talking about the hearing up spotlight here a little bit later, but the reason I started the Hearing Up Network is because I wanted to create a group of hearing care professionals who are all committed to following those best practices because we know that the, uh, the amount of individuals who are actually doing this is not very high. Right. So I think that's an important distinction is that best practices are not required. And that's the big kicker here is that there's really no enforcement of them. So states themselves can decide what they consider to be an integral part of uh, hearing treatment, we'll just say, right? So they can go in and say, this test needs to be done or this verification measure must be done. But if the state is not going in and saying that, then it's up to the provider to determine kind of what level of care that they're going to be providing. And, and so that's where best, best practices really comes in is this idea of no one's forcing them to do it necessarily, but they're doing it because they know that it results in the best possible outcomes for, for their patients. And we have data that shows that only somewhere between 20 and 30% of audiologists actually follow best practices. And honestly, I feel like that number's a little high. Yeah. I and feel like that's a little too gracious. If you ask some of the other individuals who are actually doing research and doing surveys to determine how many people are actually following it, you can get some of those estimates down at around 5%. Yeah. Because you can think of it this way. You can do some of the best practices, mm -hmm. right? But just because you do one best practice doesn't mean that you're following best practices. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you download the, the best practice checklist off of hearingup.com, you can see that there are five pages and it's a laundry list of different things that need to be done or taken into consideration. Uh, when going through adult hearing aid treatment. And, um, you know, I think the estimates that are showing 20 to 30 percent, I think that a lot of those come from people following uh, the best practice of doing real ear measurements. I feel like that's where things keep getting mixed up. This idea, and I, I've had patients say it to me, right? No, my audiologist follows best practices. I know this because they did real ear measurement. Well, real ear measurement is one small, small piece of best practice audiological care. Um, and so it's great that your provider did real ear measurement, but are they following all of the other things to really ensure that you're going to have the best possible outcomes. You know, we're gonna be talking a lot about real ear measurement uh, in future episodes of this particular series that we're doing. So we'll get into exactly what that is if you're unaware of what real ear measurement is. But let's start getting into, so when you first come into a clinic, what's the first thing that needs to happen for best practices to be followed? Well, first thing you're gonna come in, you're gonna sit down and your provider should be conducting a pretty thorough case history on you. So when we use this term case history and we're gonna to continue to use it throughout these episodes, case history really means I gotta get the full background on you as a person. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about or asking questions about your medical history, your hearing history. Um, are you noticing your hearing loss in the left ear or in the right ear? Is it at the same amounts? Do you have tinnitus? Do you have vertigo? All of these other things that kind of tie into uh, what could be progressive hearing loss conditions or kind of get some backstory on where you were before and what you're looking for currently. And the, the main goal of getting a really good thorough case history is to make sure that eventual treatment is highly individualized and highly specified to you as the individual. For sure. And, you know, different clinics will spend a different amount of time on this. Some of them will have more of a, a person-centered care approach to it, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, and they'll take typically more time to uncover these things so they can get to know you a lot more in depth. And then some clinics will literally have you fill out a checklist before you go into the clinic mm -hmm. to identify certain things about you from a medical history standpoint. Right. And we've all been there going to different doctor's offices that kind of do it that way. Um, but then after that is identified, typically doing otoscopy, so actual visualization of the outer ear and ear canal uh, portion of the outer ear to make sure that there's no obstructions inside of the ear canal, uh, like earwax yeah. or a foreign object, things like that. Of course, if that is identified, that would need to be pulled out so we can actually visualize the eardrum to make sure that there's no visual uh, uh, issue, so right. to speak, with the eardrum. Yeah, and if that's not done as part of your audiological assessment, uh, I would say go get a new one because if there's anything blocking the ear canal, that is the very first place that sound travels through. So if there's a problem with the outer ear canal, 
there's going to be a problem with your hearing test results as well. So definitely make sure that they take a look in your ears. For sure. Um, but then the next step of that is going to be moving straight into the actual hearing assessment. And so when you go into, it should be a soundproof room. I know that there are some kind of portable audiometers that just have over ear type of a thing, but chances are if you're going to a uh, like a private practice or an ear, nose, and throat clinic, you're going to be in a soundproof booth. And in there, uh, we what we're really trying to determine is what type of hearing loss do you have and how much hearing loss do you have? And that's just a really, really quick explanation of, of what we're doing in a hearing test there because we're we're testing their hearing two different ways and then doing a bunch of word testing after that as well. Yeah, pretty extensive. And again, you know, certain clinics will do this more extensively than others. But if you're following best practices, there are certain things that need to happen yep. during a hearing assessment. Definitely. We actually have an image of an audiogram that we can bring up on the screen right now to kind of give you an understanding generally uh, what a comprehensive audiogram would actually look like. So when we start going through here, we can kind of isolate in on the air conduction and bone conduction testing. That's the X's and the O's that you see on this particular graph. And this would, uh, this is when you think of putting ear inserts inside of your ears or headphones on your ears, and you have to either click a button or raise your hand when beeps are being presented. Now, there are best practice ways of going about obtaining these that we will not get into mm -hmm. inside of this particular yeah. episode, but it's very important that those are obtained accurately. I don't know how many times that we've had audiograms come in and they were not conducted in the proper way, so we get different results and things of that nature. Yep, most definitely. Then we start getting into word testing after that. So we test you through headphones, we test you through bone conduction, and now we have been able to determine the type and the severity of your hearing loss. But the X's and the O's are really just data points, objective data points, ones that we can track over time, monitor for changes. What, what we're really interested in from a communication standpoint is word understanding, word processing, uh, because the X's and the O's tell us one part of the story, but I think we get a lot more out of the story from, from word testing. For sure. You know, you think about SRTs, and we have a graphic for this. This is your speech reception thresholds. Mm -hmm. um, when you see the 30 and the 40 there on the screen, that's telling you the softest level of speech that you can barely understand. And that, to an audiologist, will typically correlate with your pure tone average, which we won't get into again. It's a technical term, but I actually like to discuss this with patients in our clinic because it lets us know if you're going to have issues with soft-spoken speech, you usually uncover it right here yeah. as well. Um, and then this transitions nicely into uh, word recognition scores. And if you had to pick one particular test, I think, that shows us the most information about how someone would do with hearing aids, it is this particular test right here, particularly in a quiet situation. Right. So when we look at a score of 90%, that tells us that when we replace missing information uh, due to a hearing loss, that individual has the ability to actually comprehend 90% of that speech. However, if you look at that score of 50% in the left ear in this particular measure, that tells us that only 50% of that speech information can be understood by an individual. And then typically when both of our ears participate in the listening task together, we see a bunch of different effects that occur, but it usually results in higher speech intelligibility as well, which is why binaurally this individual scored 100%. And I want to reiterate here, this testing should be done with recorded speech. Yep. I don't know how many times, in fact, when I went through school, we didn't even use recorded speech. We use live speech where you're trying to speak to the individual at a calibrated level, which is impossible to do, and, and get them to repeat these words back. But that gives you an unreliable result, mm -hmm. the one a result that you can't take anywhere and compare it to any other tests that you have done. That's why recorded stimuli is so important with this. You have to use recorded words. It's it's huge. There's way too many fluctuations. I mean, even as you and I are both talking right here, your voice and my voice are wildly different from one another. If I were to present a bunch of words to a patient and have them repeat them back, chances are, depending on what their hearing loss looked like, they'd have a much harder time with my voice than they would with your voice. Like you just have a strong projecting voice. We can't take these comparisons and then you know, monitor changes over time when we don't know who was the one saying those words and, you know, in what type of a situation. So the recorded stimuli is huge. It's not used enough. It most definitely should be. Um, and then patients will often say when we're kind of doing consultations, uh, you know, they tested me to words, but 
it was in a quiet, soundproof room. I mean, the world, that's not where I struggle, right? I'm okay in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's really when I'm in a restaurant or when I'm in a group setting, background noise. That's where, really where I start to struggle. Well, we're able to assess that in the clinic as well. So we have what is referred to as uh, speech and noise testing. And there's various different uh, test protocols for that. In our office, specifically, we use something called a quick sin, which is just a quick speech and noise test um, where the participant is repeating back sentences and the background noise is just slowly inching up in the back. And their job is to repeat back as many of those words in that sentence that they catch. And then it gives us a score. So tell us what that score Yeah, really so means. signal to noise ratio loss score. So you see SNR degree of loss right there. So individuals who score low on this scale, closer to zero, that means that they should be able to go into a background noise situation and do well with their hearing aids as long as they've been fit in accordance with best practices. However, if you get towards the top end of that scale, closer towards 26, that means that you could have the best hearing aids in the world fit perfectly and you will go into a background noise situation and you will still struggle. And that's why having this score is so important for a hearing care professional to know and to convey to their patient because otherwise you're setting someone up for unrealistic expectations mm -hmm. potentially um, and that can lead to someone feeling like, hey, this treatment that I'm getting is not actually the right treatment for me and they go throughout their entire time with that treatment wondering, could it be better? Could it be better? And yeah. so that's what's really important about this testing is that we don't know until we measure. And if you're not following best practices, if you're not doing these measurements, we cannot do our job to our full capacity. Yeah. Yeah. This, this test is one of those things that is also just, it's really not done often enough, but could really help both the professional and the patient at the same exact time have just yeah, better expectations and a better experience overall. Absolutely, so. and let's touch base really quick on UCL. So this is your uncomfortable listening levels. Um, this is, uh, we do this test to make sure that we do not over amplify sound with hearing aids. So that's why this particular test is so important because you don't wanna get hearing aids and just feel like everything's being blasted out for you. You wanna make sure that you're staying within this dynamic range of your comfort uh, to a reasonable degree. You still want loud things to sound loud, but not uncomfortable. And so you have to measure the uncomfortable listening levels because the estimates that are out there that are preset inside of hearing aids are oftentimes not correct. Right. So you have to make sure that you identify what these UCLs are. And again, you can't just make an assumption off of an audiogram. You have, or by, based off of the air tone or the pure tone air conduction testing, yeah. you have to run the test of UCLs to identify that. So we are going to show you how all of this stuff ties in here in a little bit after the hearing up segment. Just want to make sure that you guys know to ask your questions if you haven't started asking your questions already. Make sure that they are contextual to the topic that we're talking about today if you want a better shot of those questions getting answered. Also, if you have not yet hit the like button or the subscribe button, go ahead and do that as well if you want to make sure that you don't miss any of our future videos. All right, so looks like, you know what? I'm doing the EOSERA you are. Uh, plug today. So here's the thing. Um, I love EOSERA. I've been doing uh, work with EOSERA for a while now. I've actually made a video, a comparison video of the EOSERA Earwax MD mm -hmm. product, which is a earwax softening product that you can use to get earwax out of your own ears, which I greatly appreciate because if you can come into my clinic with clean ears already, half of my job is already done, great. right? Yeah. Um, and that way when I'm following best practices of doing otoscopy, um, I don't have any issues with that. Um, but I did comparisons of the Earwax MD product from EOSERA with other major brands that are out there. And EOSERA, in my opinion, blows the other options away. And I that's something that we use in our clinic every day yep. uh, to remove earwax, really stubborn earwax. So uh, the tricky thing is though with removing your own earwax is that sometimes you don't know A, if you have earwax, mm -hmm. if you might think you do, but you might not. And number two is, did you get the earwax out? And that's why the EarView ND uh, camera that you can stick inside of your own ear to see if you actually have earwax is such a critical piece of equipment. And I've had patients, again, they go onto Amazon, they buy some like cheap, you know, ear camera, and they have no clue what they're looking at because either the resolution of the camera is so bad yep. or they have it spun upside down and they can't tell which direction they're looking in anymore. Right. The EarView MD solves all these problems. Yeah, so crazy. I think it is a great combo. If you want to try to remove your own earwax, you get the earwax MD, you get the EarView MD, and then you actually just take care of the problem yourself as long as you don't have a perforation inside your eardrum, right? Yep. And so if you guys want to get these products, which I do highly recommend, visit e 
eosera.com and use the promo code CLIFF20 for 20% off your entire purchase. And on top of that, these these the prices for these products are reasonable anyway. Uh, and then you get another discount on top of that. So thank you, eosera. Definitely. Thanks so much, eosera. So we are moving now into our Hearing Up Provider Spotlight, and you kind of touched on Hearing Up earlier, but obviously this is a best practice provider network of professionals across the country and now moving internationally as well who follow these best practices that we're talking about right now. And so for today, we have Dr. Liz White joining us. Liz White got her bachelor's in communicative sciences and disorders from the University of Florida, and then she got her doctorate from the University of Louisville. Uh, she's been practicing for 17 years, and she's currently at Harbor City Hearing Solutions in Melbourne, Florida. She's the Florida Academy of Audiology Vice President of Membership and the American Academy of Audiology Foundation Treasurer, and she wants nothing but success for her patients, and she made that very clear. She demonstrates this by completing a comprehensive communication needs assessment with all of her patients, uh, demoing hearing aids on her patients so that they're sure in their decision, um, and, and she's very strict on them wearing those hearing aids all day, every day, which I love. And, and she wrote on here too, something that you'll hear her say a lot is that if the patient is not successful, then she is not successful and failure is not an option in this practice. Whew. And I love that commitment to success that and is commitment great. to patient outcomes. Man, so. I kind of want to steal that in our clinic. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, that you just got a whole new rule uh, employed in our clinic now, <laughs> Dr. White. But um, thank you so much, Dr. White, for joining us. That is, uh, we're so excited to have you here today. Hello. And, hello. And you know what? Uh, I just read that bullet there about the comprehensive communication needs assessment. And we are just about to jump into a discussion about hearing aid selection. So can you tell me a little bit about why a communication needs assessment is so important in determining the appropriate hearing aids for a patient? Well, I think, I mean, first I have to say, you guys were talking and I'm like, yes. And I'm like, yes, that too. And everything was like, we got to talk about this more often. Everybody needs to know this stuff. I was just like cheering you guys on. So thank you because we all believe in them. Not all, three of us and some others yeah. believe in this. So thank you so much. Um, but just like you said, patients are different. You know, you, have, I, I, you could have a 42 year old who's super active and then you could have a 98 year old who sits at home and watches TV all day. So if you don't get to understand the individual characteristics of each patient and do, um, I can't think of the word, surveys and do different forms and find out more about their daily life activities, you're just like throwing things at people and you don't, you don't really know how it's going to affect them. You know, that's something that has always confused me about how any recommendation could ever be made until you truly feel like you understand what the patient's going through and what their specific wants and needs are. Um, and I think that's why this is such an integral part of following best practices. So why, uh, I mean, you're in the, the Hearing Up Provider Network and we're all committed to following best practices. Why is that so important to you? Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Florida is referred to as the wild, wild west of hearing aid care, um, but it is. And you could drive down this main road I'm off of and and see a million hearing aid retail clinics who are just kind of doing what an OCC product could do, just kind of throwing the hearing aid on the person and not not having the right acoustic coupling and not measuring really or not measuring live speech and i i just i've seen it so much and i i was trained on it when i was in my residency i was trained on it when i worked at the va you do that on every single patient at the va and then i went somewhere to work and they didn't they wouldn't buy into it and they're like no we're not buying that and i was like wait you're supposed to be the best place in this county and you're yeah. not going to purchase this equipment and so that was one of my main reasons that i had to go out on my own because i can see the difference when i get inherited patients in my office and i change one simple thing or measure with real ear they're like oh wow everything is much brighter and clearer this and I, that's how it should have been for the past three years yeah. so i I am all about making those life-changing things, so. Well, that's awesome. I think that you know, best practices are really the cornerstone that we have to stand on. And then on top of that, doing it in a person-centered care way, I do want to touch base on that a little bit because I think a lot of people misunderstand the difference between best practices and person-centered care. You know, Best practices are the things that we do and person-centered care is almost like the way that we do them. So mm -hmm. how do you really incorporate your patients into this entire treatment process in your clinic? So I, I would, I, not everybody comes in with a, 
um, a spouse or um, a caregiver or a friend, but I think that is really important because sometimes one person's not really telling the honest truth about what their day-to-day -day life is. So having a, someone else to play off of is, is important. Um, and everyone, I mean, just everyone is different. Like, and I, one of the things I love about one of the particular manuf manufacturers is that you can, after the, or during their demo period, you can see how much time they're spending in quiet, how much time they're spending in noise, how much time they're in music. So when they come back in, I go, 99% of your time is in quiet. We kind of know like what your life is like and, or the flop, you're streaming 55% of your day. Let's talk about what that's gonna do to your battery life maybe. So like e everybody is so individual and the people that you think are gonna be like streaming people are not streaming people. So just, you have to learn about your own patients. And we, in my office, we spend so much time with them. It's not like a, a run of the mill type of, you know, assembly line. We schedule an hour and a half, two hours with the patient so that we can get down to the nitty gritty of, of what's going on with them. Yeah, it sounds a lot like our clinic. It does sound a lot like our clinic. And I, I can definitely I know when you relate. guys were talking earlier, I was like, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay, perfect. good. So we're all on the same page. That's, that's awesome. Um, yes. I completely yes. agree. I also worked at a practice where same thing. Um, you, you get into this practice and I had done my externship at the VA. And so I was also following, um, maybe not all best practices, but definitely a few of those benchmarks. Right. And then going to, you know, my first position outside of school, that shock of like, oh, wait, not everywhere, not everywhere operates this way. Uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to fight to get them to realize the value in delivering services in this particular manner for best possible outcomes. I mean, it's just kind of, it's crazy. And I'm glad that you were also able to break the mold and get out of that situation and, and be able to, to adhere to best practices for your patients, because it makes all of the difference. It is all of the difference. You know, and Dr. White, I mean, your situation is very similar to a lot of audiologist situations, I feel, is that they go, they work somewhere, and they realize that the main goal of the clinic that they're working for is to optimize, you know, patient scene, revenue generated, things like that. Um, and it's like you're just like sacrificing your soul inside of that particular location. And I don't think it's any secret why all of the Hearing Up Network members currently are from private practices. Because when you're in private practice, you get to decide how much time you spend with the patient. And if there's one variable that's the same between every best practice provider is that they spend time with the patient. Because you can't even do the best practices if you don't have time. Yeah. So true, yes, yes. So, you know, I just really appreciate you. I thank you for coming on here today. Um, it's always fun to catch up with you. I know you have a couple of uh, kids here in a bunch of sports, like you mentioned before. So you taking time out of your schedule is greatly appreciated. Yes. So thank definitely. Let Can I just mention one thing? Yeah. You guys were talking about the 20 to 30 percent. I know in my part of the world, that is way too high. In, in yeah. my county, there are, besides the VA, there are a couple of us that are using best practices and yeah. just one of us that's part of the, the hearing up network. So it's, it's awful and it's sad. And I try to educate everybody if I can, but you know, sometimes you can't beat the competitors and their ads. Well, you know, I mean, and that's the thing. And I feel like that's why I had to start the network because I mean, I had people asking us from all over the country, like, where do I go? And I'm like, I have no yes. idea. And when you start talking about how like, 5% of clinics actually do it. It's like, well, roll the dice because one out of 20, you know, I mean, that's not a very good chance that they're going to accidentally come into Harbor City Hearing Solutions and find you. I mean, some people will get lucky, but there's a lot of people who are looking for best practice care and they just cannot find it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where true. can they find yeah. you? So I have an office which is on the border of Melbourne and Rockledge in Brevard County, Florida. It's called Harbor City Hearing Solutions and our website is harborcityhearing.com. We also have a Facebook page, um, Instagram, Twitter as well. I'm not really active on Twitter. And then our phone number is 321-622-6385. And you'll speak to the lovely Marie. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> All right, well, Dr. White, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you. Thank you for being in the network and I'll probably see you soon. See you soon. Thanks, Dr. Cliff. Thanks so much. And Dr. Cook. <laughs> Bye. Well, that was great. That was great. She is great. And it's, you know, when she was saying, like, I've, I'm on this entire strip of, of 
uh, hearing aid clinics or audiology clinics, and she's the only one locally that's following all these best practices. It's like, that's so crazy. I know, it's like, but here's the thing. The only limitation is people being aware of that being the case. Right. And honestly, the channel that, that we have and that you're on now, and by the way, quick little plug, the first video that you published on the Dr. Cliff channel was yesterday talking about OTC and prescription hearing aids. So if you guys have not checked that out, you got to get over there and check it out after the episode, though. Yeah, okay. later. Um, but but that's I, the whole reason that we're doing educational content is because people just don't know. Yep. And there's no other good, like really good sources of information to find people who are doing things in the right way. And when I say the right way, there is a right way. It is following best practices mm -hmm. and doing it in a person-centered care approach. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, um, okay, off of my soapbox now, we got to get into ESCO. And you have a really good story. I do. I do. So uh, I've got permission to use names in this story. Um, but I have a patient who came in this week. Uh, we're doing a follow-up with him. His name is Phil. Hi, Phil. And he was referred to me by his friend and one of my previous patients, Steve. So hi, Steve. And uh he came in this week for his follow-up and he's telling me okay everything's going great and wonderful and i and very quickly he goes and i almost lost the hearing aids but other than that and i said whoa 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 come right back to that right uh he had actually gone to the arizona i think it's a state fair yeah. right uh he's having a great time he's walking around everything's wonderful and he decides to get on the biggest largest scariest roller coaster ride that exists at the fair and it was having a great time until about halfway through when he said he started feeling this little shifting out of his ear and he realized very quickly my hearing aids are on and they are falling out of my ears mid-air like right now on, on this ride um, and so he quickly cupped his hands over his ears like that uh, and tried to hold on to them for dear life and uh, yeah all of this to say that even when you take all of the steps to try to keep really close eye on your hearing aids and not lose them and not damage them. Sometimes you're just walking along at a fair and you want to go get on a ride and your hearing aids, you might remember that they're there, but if they're programmed well, maybe you don't remember that they're there uh, and they can just fly off halfway through the ride. So luckily he did not. But in the case that you did lose your hearing aids uh, and let's say you were even out of warranty at that point, you better hope at that point that you've got coverage through ESCO uh, because ESCO specializes in providing loss and damage coverage and repair insurance for your hearing aids so that you don't have to pay for expensive out of warranty repairs or buy new hearing aids before you are ready for new hearing aids. So if they've got a variety of coverage plans online. You can also get a quote for your exact hearing aids on their website. Um, if you register your hearing aids on their website, you will actually get a $10 Visa gift card just for registering them. And if you go to esco.com forward slash Dr. Cliff, um, the Dr. Cliff show viewers, that's where you will be able to find that link to redeem that gift card as well. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you, Esco. Thank you, Esco. So, okay, we need to tie in what we talked about earlier, all the stuff that Dr. White was cheering for yes. on her end that we were talking about, and kind of tie them into, okay, we've got all the testing done. Now we need to actually get to know what the patient, what their wants and needs are for treatment, mm -hmm. and then determine what treatment we're going to recommend. And so there is a, a best practice approach to this. So when we have a hearing aid candidate that we've identified from all of the testing, we need to make sure that we actually identify what their needs are, and we can do that through a needs assessment. So when we're doing needs assessment with patients, we're identifying what are the areas that you're struggling in, mm -hmm. you know, what is it, TV, telephone, background noise, group situations, one-on-one -on -one conversation with and without noise. Uh, are you going to large public venues that you need to be able to hear, like live performance theater and things like that? And then we start to identify how much difficulty are you having right. in those situations. But you're really st starting to drill down into the actual areas of difficulty because if someone's not having difficulties in, in a large public venue, like, and they're like, I never go to those things. Well, all of a sudden, that is not important to me anymore mm -hmm. to help them here in that type of a venue, right? And we need to focus on the things that are more important to them. So that's why doing a needs assessment is so important. And then on top of that, you need to drill down into what are the most important things for that individual because you might think that you have an understanding of what the most important thing is because they told you they have trouble on TV, but it turns out they don't watch a whole lot of TV and they don't care, yeah. right? So you have to make sure that you're identifying what those particular things are. And then once you I identify that, then you can start going into other personal considerations as well. Right, so I think that this is, the needs assessment really comes in when you have two what you would think would be identical individuals, right? Maybe they're 
both guys and they're the same age and they're both working in similar fields, but then you ask one, what's your top priority? Oh, it's TV and family situations. You ask the other one, what's your top priority? And they're saying it's social situations and their church groups. Um, so. Uh, personal considerations aside, this is really where the needs assessment comes in. But then there's also the considerations of everyone is is really, really different. And so first and foremost, employment, right? So are you working? Are you not? Generally, that leads to either more dynamic uh, listening situations if you're still working or like meeting type of situations, or maybe you're just doing a lot of calls through Zoom and phone calls and things like that. Uh, what hobbies do you have? I think that this one is huge, and I, I, I don't think that enough providers ask about what the person's actual hobbies are, because number one, like sweat plays a role in, in how long your hearing aids are working and how well that they're working. Um, and uh, I have a patient, in fact, who is a cowboy mounted shooter. So he literally rides horses and shoots at targets at the same exact time. Like, we got to pick the right hearing aid for that because he does fall off these horses sometimes. Uh, it does happen. So um, also, how old are these patients and what is their dexterity ability as well. So like the ability to grip onto small things and see things. Um, and that's where vision really comes into play as well. And then just what features are they looking for? So this kind of goes back to the needs assessment again as well, but just connectivity. Do you want a Bluetooth stream? Are you trying to have rechargeable hearing aids? Are you trying to pair up to an app? Things yeah, like that. Yeah, some people have no idea. And some people come in like, hey, I've done a bunch of research and I feel like this is what mm -hmm. I'd like. And it's like, okay, well, let's discuss why you feel that. And then if that's true, it's like, great. Then when we're doing hearing aid selection, which we're gonna get into right now, we need to make sure that we have listened to those wants and needs and we incorporate them as much as we possibly can. Most definitely. So so we have a bunch of different audios for this that we we're going to be able to go through. And so when you start looking at considerations based off of the audiogram that we showed a little bit earlier through testing, we literally have this up on the screen when we start talking about different considerations mm -hmm. with a patient. So for instance, would you need one hearing aid or would you need two hearing aids? Yep. Well, if you have normal hearing in one ear and a mild high frequency hearing loss in the other ear, you might only need one actual hearing aid mm -hmm. to treat that that particular type of hearing loss. Um, this is a big one, power level. So we actually have an audiogram that we can pull up here on the screen that will kind of illustrate this for you. Um, the cross audio is gonna uh, show that we have one particular ear that's in the normal range right there. And you typically would not fit that with a hearing aid and said, and except for some like very outside of the box circumstances. But that ear on the left side, which would be the blue X's and blue boxes, you can see how that starts sloping down into the profound hearing loss range. You need to make sure that you have a hearing aid that can generate the amount of power or amplification to actually touch that hearing loss. And not all hearing aids can do it. So that has to be a very significant consideration here. Most definitely, yeah. If we switch to the flat loss audio that we've got as well, that one popped up on the screen where all of the thresholds in the right ear and the left ear are falling into that moderate range. The amount of power that we would need to accommodate a hearing loss like that is not going to be the same as the previous one that we just saw. Uh, you need a lower level of power because we don't need to apply nearly the same amount of amplification to that ear. Um, and that this is also where ear canal characteristics come into play too. Jump into that one for us. For sure. So when you start looking at ear canal characteristics, first of all, do they have an ear canal that can even hold like an invisible in the canal hearing aid. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, when you use a really small hearing aid down inside of your ear canal, you generally cannot create as much power as you need yeah. to overcome that level of hearing loss. So someone might come into the office and say, listen, if you're listening to my wants and needs, you're gonna give me an invisible hearing aid. And I'll be like, listen, I'll get you an invisible hearing aid, but you have to understand that that hearing aid is not actually capable of treating your level of hearing loss. Whether you want to hear that or not, you need to understand that. Right. And so going through the audiogram with an individual uh, is very important in this recommendation process. And that kind of leads nicely into this style recommendation. We have a asymmetrical audiogram that we are going to put up on the screen right now. This is from one individual, and if we were to fit the same hearing aid the same way for each of those ears, the red circles being the right ear, the blue X's being the left ear, you would have a horrible outcome yeah. with this particular type of hearing loss. So we need to make sure that when we're doing a recommendation from a style perspective, whether we're going to go with the receiver and canal hearing aid, or a custom hearing aid, or a receiver and canal hearing aid with a custom component, those are all things that need to be taken into consideration when you're following best practices for doing recommendation of technology. Right. 
And I think that this is just, it's huge. And I think we, we very often get the question, what's the best hearing aid for me? What's the best one, the best one on the market? It doesn't matter if it's the best one on the market, if it's not the best one for you. If it's not the best hearing aid for your hearing loss, you are not going to have good outcomes with it. It could cost $10,000, it doesn't matter. If it's not individualized to your hearing loss prescription into your individual wants and needs, there's really no point. Yeah, I tell people all the time, if you go to a provider who does not follow best practices, you might as well buy the cheapest hearing aid that they have because they're not going to be doing the things necessary to optimize the performance of those devices anyway. Right. And it's really just kind of sad that, you know, there is such a low percentage of providers. And I think the reason is, is because consumers, individuals with hearing loss, are willing to accept that level of care. And the only way that you stop that stuff from happening is that you have to demand a higher level of care. Yeah. Um, and so you informing yourself by watching this content, by watching the other content that we've created on the channel is really going to help you advocate for yourself, which is a hugely important part of this process. And then uh, lastly here for this particular part of the sequence that we're following is goal setting. Yep. I think uh, not a lot of clinics do proper goal setting with yeah. their patients either. Yeah, so goal setting is really, um, we're gonna take those environments that are the considered the most important to you that we determined in your needs assessment for early on um, and really try to make sure that once we've gotten you through the adaptation period, are you seeing improvements in those areas? Are you seeing a benefit? Are you getting out of treatment what you were expecting to get out of treatment? Because we've gotta make sure that we are addressing the things that you came into us needing and making sure that we're doing it at a, at a really high level as well. And so the, the clinics that are gonna be doing that are gonna be doing something like the COSI. So mm -hmm. there are very specific questionnaires that can be used to gauge how much benefit you're actually receiving from your hearing aids. And then we have a validated way of measuring the outcome that you are having subjectively. Right. Asking the question, how does that sound? Or how do you think you're doing? Are not specific enough for us to know if we are actually solving the problems that you wanted to solve when you came in for treatment. So if you're going to be following best practices, you're going to have a validated outcome measure like the COSI, like a variety of other questionnaires that are out there that are validated questionnaires. Whichever one your provider uses, that's great. They just have to make sure that they're using a very structured questionnaire for that. Most definitely. All right. So that concludes uh, what we're going to be talking about this week for the most part. But stick around because we have questions coming up. But before we get to the questions, I'm going to be talking about the Resound Custom Hearing Aid. So when you start looking at custom devices, a lot a lot of the old custom styles that you see out there on the market are just not that cool looking. And to be honest, hearing aids are starting to turn into a little bit more of a piece of tech, a little bit more of a piece of fashion for some individuals. And so when you start considering the different devices that are out there, going with a custom device from Resound, these guys are by far the coolest looking custom hearing aids that I have ever seen. Then on top of that, the technology that's inside of these, these are not just your run of the mill earbuds. They actually have worked, it appears closely with Jabra, who's a major consumer electronics brand, to make these devices as stylish as possible. And because Resound makes them, they have really nice hearing aid technology built inside of them. So whether you get a physical impression done of your ears or a 3D impression of your ears, you can get these devices. And if your hearing care professional is following best practices, you will have a fantastic outcome with the Resound, uh, the customs by Resound. Now, if you want to learn more about these particular hearing aids, go to resound.com. I've done reviews on these particular devices as well. So you can go to the YouTube channel and check those out. Okay. Everyone's favorite part. We're jumping into questions here. Hi, Q &A. Hello. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Time for our wonderful Q&A session. Thank you all again for being very involved in the comment section and making sure that I get your questions so that we can answer them live. Yeah. Um, so the first one is more about uh, kind of going back towards the beginning of the show when we were talking about testing. Um, and it was a bit of a longer question from a viewer that has been with us from the beginning. Um, but I condensed it down to make it a little bit easier to understand. So I hope that my question is clear. Um, so word recognition scores using that live voice that we were talking about instead of recorded speech. For this person, it didn't show that he had any difficulty understanding speech even with an identified hearing loss on those X's and O's. Um, why is it that someone would have no deficits on that test score, um, but they know that they struggle with soft-spoken individuals and things in their everyday life, but their word recognition says they score, I don't know, 100%, for example. Why is that? 
I know why that is. Yeah, I mean, I know we both do. Yeah. Uh, do you want to take this one? I'll start it. Okay. Um, so when we are doing word recognition scores, what we're actually doing is taking the X's and O's that we got earlier, your, your hearing threshold, and we are presenting the words at a level that in theory should replace some of those missing speech components that um, we have determined that you're missing from the hearing test. So what we're really doing is we're presenting these words at a level where you should be performing well. Uh, and then we kind of go from there to see if you are performing well or not. But you're exactly right. Even if you have a hearing loss and you know that you struggle with individuals or in group settings, um, it's really the level that we're presenting the words at. If we were to present the words at average conversational level or even below that, chances are your score would come down significantly. Um, but we're presenting them at a level in theory where things should be more available to you. Speech sounds should be more available to you. Absolutely. Um, I, we're measuring two different things mm -hmm. with word recognition scores compared to thresholds, which are those X's and O's on the graph. The X's and O's are telling us the softest level of sound that you can barely hear and we're playing beeps for you and that's essentially testing the outer hair cells inside of your hearing organ when we start getting into word recognition scores it's kind of like what you said we're replacing these missing sounds that we know that you're missing mm -hmm. so we're, it's almost kind of like we're simulating a hearing aid like a very crude simulation of a hearing aid to see okay well if we were to overcome that level of hearing loss that you have what was your ability to understand yeah. that information again and that's really measuring your inner hair cell function and then your overall uh, cognitive processing ability of that speech information. Right. And monitored live voice, again, with the fluctuations in individuals' voice patterns, you may perform much higher than you actually would have had those presentations been more standardized. That's true. So. It, typically, people have inflated scores with mm -hmm. word recognition mm -hmm. when it's presented live. And in fact, I had a patient come in today, or was it yesterday? Yesterday and today, actually, that um, the speech scores that they brought in from the audiogram from their previous provider was monitored live voice. And as soon as I see that, I'm like, well, looks like we have to do another hearing test because yep. I can't trust this at all. Yep, mm -hmm. yep definitely. Great. Thank you guys for clearing that up. I know that a couple people had questions about it, so thank yeah. you guys. Um, the next question is, if audiologists have these proven ways to make hearing aids work and work well, why don't they all do them and why aren't they required to do them like a doctor is required to wash hands before surgery, like your example earlier? I'd like to know the answer too. Uh, the million dollar question, right? Uh, time, I think, is one of the major factors. I, I mean, it I, is the major share factor. your experience again for the viewers because you came from a place that did not follow best practices. Right. Um, I think, I think you kind of have to look at what business practice that you're working with, right? Because there's going to be an ultimate end goal at any business that you choose to work with in this manner, or even any medical practice, and. Uh, there can be either this really significant pillar put, like Dr. White said earlier, on productivity. How many patients can you see? How quickly can you get them in and out? How much you know, revenue can we generate? Um, and that's really where the focus lies, is seeing it as a business and how successful the business is. Um, but I think that when you're in any sort of patient care, regardless of the, the field, when you put this emphasis on patient care, you're putting way more time into these interactions. You're following all of these best practice steps. Um, you've got to be seen at a clinic that values patient outcomes just as much or even more than they value the actual revenue that, that's generated from that. Absolutely. You know, I always, I talk to students a lot and students, they come out and they're like, okay, um, how do I make sure that I go to a good place? I'm like, well, Here's the thing, you have to be willing to turn down a job if they're not going to let you follow best practices, if they don't have the equipment to do it. And essentially what you're making is the decision of either you as an individual are more important, and, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but you're making a choice to earn a living, to feed your family, to pay for your student loans, and you're doing that at the expense of your patient though. Yeah. Like from an ethical moral standpoint, there, there's a disconnect. And I think people convince themselves that like, oh, well, even if they don't follow best practices, I'm still going to do the best I possibly can for them within the confines of what they let me do. And I'm sorry, I just, I, if you're going to do that, then you do you. But for myself, I just want you to feel bad about it as a provider. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it is a huge deal. We see it all of the time and your heart can be in the right place. 
But at the end of the day, we do know that the best possible outcomes occur when best best practices are followed. Uh, and so if you want to also receive the best possible outcomes, it just, the best practices have to be done. And I just- You gotta I, find someone that's doing it. I feel like our job is so important that our patients deserve to have everything done the best possible yeah. way, right? I, I just, I can't wrap my head around this idea of knowingly doing something that you know is gonna result in a poorer outcome for them or a questionable outcome. Mm -hmm. Like why not know? Yeah. Why not know that you have them at their absolute best? And that's why I feel like we're just on this crusade yeah. with best practices. We have the technology, we have the knowledge, let's use it, let's do it. I wholeheartedly agree. Um, so our next question is from an audiologist living in Lebanon. Uh, do you have any tips on how to make our consumers better informed decision makers? Unfortunately, ASHA or any other guidelines are not mandatory here. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, that's the whole point of what you've been doing the last five years, right? It depends on how convincing we are. Consumer education. I mean, the thing is, is that the thing I don't like about the platform that I have is that I communicate well with certain people mm -hmm. and I don't communicate well with other people. And I feel like that's why I need to bring in individuals who have different communication styles. And uh, I think that that is the biggest limitation is that we just have to be able to get through to these individuals. And we are kind of confined to this medium of the internet, whether it's with you know blog writing that we do at mm -hmm. our clinic every day, whether it's video content that we do, whether it's converting this stuff over into audio so people can consume it in any way possible. The only thing that we can't do is literally drive around to Lebanon and have a conference there for all of the individuals in that city who have hearing loss and convince them that they need to find a provider who follows best practices right I wish we could though I mean that'd and be great also I think that just don't ever to this particular audiologist don't forget the power that you have within your own community to really start changing those conversations and shaping those conversations uh, I think we so often see patients who then refer their friends re refer their family and suddenly we're we're serving an entire family unit I'm talking mom dad daughter like it's the word of mouth thing, you know, it takes a little bit longer than maybe some of these blasted out ads, but those are real, thorough, solid connections. And so follow the best practices as best as you can to, you know, to your ability, and then kind of just let the outcomes speak for themselves. If you can start your own, you know, channel and things like that in a more local area, go for it. Um, it's just, it's important to get the word out as much you as know, you can. You know, there's not a single piece of research or data that's out there on both the consumer side and the provider side that says that best practices are bad. I mean, when you when you start looking at the, the outcomes for the patient, it's always better to go to a provider who follows best practices. When you look at the outcomes for a practice or a clinician, it is always more positive interactions that you have yep. with your patients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just, it, it boggles my mind and we will probably continue to rack our brains for years to come yeah. at why more providers slash all providers don't follow best practices. But uh, before I retire, if I can get that number from 5% up to 20%, I would uh, retire a happy man. Right. It almost reminds me of the movie Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. Uh, and so mm -hmm. build that, you know, take pride in, in what it is that you do. And really like Dr. Cook was saying, you know, if you value your patients, they will in turn, val in turn value you. Yeah. Um, and that's a very important exchange to be having, a very important conversation to have with your patients and with your community at large. For sure. Yep. I think we may have time for one more question if you got one loaded up for us. Oh, I do, and it's a heavy hitter. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, is this why I've heard a lot of my friends say that audiologists are a scam because they're not following best practices? I mean... Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, I think that audiologists, any anyone that does follow best practices or or delivers a really, really high level of care, it's it's difficult to not get animated in these conversations because really, what we do and the level that we do it at is brought down by other providers. That we see patients all the time that come in with just abysmally fit hearing aids and from audiologists too and I'm and they say well why did this happen aren't they an audiologist as well and I say huh, yeah they are I don't I don't know what to tell you in that moment you know so um, unfortunately I do think that that's why we have or that's why some audiologists have maybe poorer 
public image yeah. in that respect. And we, I knew coming into this profession that we did not have the greatest public image yeah. out there. Um, you know, people just associate hearing aids as being over overpriced medical devices, and the only reason that they cost so much is because you have to go in and see one of these blasted audiologists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason I didn't start an audiology network, I mean, it's audiologists primarily, but the reason I didn't start just like a, a searching locator tool for audiologists is because audiologists all do not provide the same level of outcome. No. And the mm -hmm. only way that I could identify if a provider was going to provide a higher level of outcome was if I felt that they were truly following best practices. Right. And, and that's the, the equalizer right there. So, I mean, you could be someone who doesn't have good presence with your patients, poor bedside manner, but if you're following best practices, you're at least going to achieve a really high level outcome mm -hmm. with them. Uh, of course, it'd be better if you had better uh, bedside, <laughs> bedside manner, manner yeah. right? But, you know, I just, it's a tough one. I, I hate to think of our, and here's the thing. I don't want to make it sound like everybody that comes into us from another clinic that we're just ragging on their audiologist that they did a bad job. It's like, we do not have the benefit of having been in there and yeah. know what they talked about. So we mm -hmm. only get the information from the patient and sometimes they're not bringing in all of the information or they only remember certain things. Totally. And, and, and I, listen, if every single provider came to me and said, Cliff, I'm gonna start doing best practices, then you know what, you are good in my book. Yep. So I don't wanna make it sound like that we're just trying to attack our own profession. That is not what no. I want. I just want all of us to start doing the right thing. And the best way that I know how is to convince a consumer who's willing to pay money for the best thing to force their provider to do them. Right, be the biggest and strongest possible advocate for yourself in all medical decisions, hearing treatment included. Absolutely. Awesome. Excellent. Well, hey guys, thank you so much for all of those great questions. Obviously, you can see that we get these questions a lot and we are up on our soapboxes the entire time. <laughs> but we thank you greatly for joining us today. Make sure that you're joining us for the next two weeks as well because this is just part one of a three-part series of us talking about best practices. Now, if you want to join us live for this show, we are on every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Arizona time. Yes, the clocks are changing across the country. Actually, across the world, I think, potentially right around this time. But definitely across the United States, just just remember that Arizona time zone stays the same while, every, while everybody else changes. So that's 4 p.m. Arizona time on Facebook Live, you, uh, on YouTube Live, and WTSMTV.com. And as always, we'll see you next week.